an original MCM production. The issue of reentry um, is something that speaking to Senator Taylor and speaking to the district attorney, John Chisholm, uh, now I'm really interested. So um, uh, teaching uh, criminology and delinquency, I think what they did was crystallize the importance of this topic, not only to our community, okay, but to the country as a whole. So um, I think you're going to get a lot of valuable information. I mean, with the highest black male incarceration rate in the country, the fact is that people have to come back to the community. Okay, They're coming back to the community. So what do we do to reduce the recidivism rate? So what do we do to train people, educate people, give people jobs so that they, again, become integral parts of the community. Our, your moderator is Ms. Viana Jordan. Good morning, Ms. Jordan. Good morning. Good morning, community brainstorming. I'm glad you all are here. I know within my community, somebody knows a felon and it's time that we start dealing with this matter so that they can be active and productive. I'd also like to mention one thing that I found alarming this morning is that the gap between blacks and whites graduating from high school has increased in the state of Wisconsin where we are number one in the nation. for non-graduations and the gap between blacks and whites graduation graduating has widened. And as Sen Senator um, Lena Taylor has just said, this is the pathway to prison. So if we don't get, nip it in the bud early, we know the fate. Okay, with that being said, we will First, um, hear from Senator Lena Taylor, who will lay the foundation of what we're talking about today. Senator Taylor. First of all, let me say good morning, brainstorming. Good morning, family. It is truly a pleasure to be here with you today. And I have to say, when I'm normally talking about these topics, I'm in Madison and I was just talking about these topics, it seems like yesterday or in the last few days is so much. Um, and it's not always a pleasure. Uh, so uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be with you today. So often also the news and the things that we talk about are not good news for Milwaukee. And I, I wanna back up and tell you about when I was standing on the corner of 29th and North Avenue. I was about 11 and it was back then the strip and there was people prostituting and I wanted to become a lawyer because I saw the injustices because I also you know knew about this cop named Blondie I don't I don't know how many people know about Blondie but Blondie was real and I saw different things happening and it's why I ultimately wanted to become a lawyer because I wanted to be a part of helping to clean that up. But God in his infinite wisdom knew I didn't need to be a DA and that's probably why E. Michael McCann didn't hire me and I became a public defender. And praise God that I became a public defender. Because I fought that fight, and I'm glad to see Don Rablin here, uh, one of the individuals that, uh, when I was a new lawyer in the public defender's office, was there with me, and she's still there, fighting the good fight. I just want to give a shout out to all my public defender family who have caseloads that are too high, 
cases that are extremely challenging and not always DAs that are cooperative. <laughs> but I do want to give a shout out to the DA that I did my first case with. Yeah, he was quick thinking on his feet. We had a case and she had a knife and she used the knife on the guy. And he picked up the phone when he got to do his rebuttal and said she could have chose this. And he picked up the knife or she could have chose this and he had taken the receiver off of the deputy's desk. I knew then it wasn't gonna go well. <laughs> the jury was gonna pick the phone. That DA was DA Chisholm. And um, I have to say to you that I don't always agree with him, but I know the difference between the DA's office of the 11 year old, the DA's office of the public defender, the DA's office of when I became a state senator and I started the justice State of the Justice Tour, where I took the Judiciary Committee around to 10 institutions. We talked to the wardens, the staff, and we talked to the inmates. I had a town hall inside the prison and one outside. I'm proud that eight years later, the president has gone to the federal institutions, but I went to 10, Mr. President. I'm just saying. And then we took that information and we did the State of the Justice Tour. I mean, the justice reinvestment effort. And we did that with, you heard Mr. Um, um, uh, Wisdom, um, Joel Wanger, th uh, thank you. Um, Joel, thank you, Reverend. Um, stand up and talk about the Second Chance Act. Well, the Second Chance Act is all housed in a place called the Justice Center. They are the clearinghouse for the best practices that exist in the nation. They came, studied our state in 2008 and 9, I chaired the committee. I considered it an honor, an Oprah full circle moment. Um, chaired the committee and they made recommendations of what we needed to do. And we got some of those things in and our then governor, he did pull some of it back and put it in the Department of Corrections and I'm not gonna lie, I wasn't happy. But the Department of Corrections continued that work and you're gonna hear about that work from Dr. Jackson. But I wanna give credit where credit is due because you know if I don't like it, I'm gonna say that too. Somebody came back that I put on the committee, a couple people, and they did work in Milwaukee County. And I need to give a shout out to not only um, Judge Krimmers for the work that they did on the Milwaukee Community Justice Council, but I have to give a shout out to D.A. Chisholm because he came back and did that work. I know, I know we wanna hate him right now, but I gotta tell the truth and shame the devil. So he came back and did the work and whether we know it or not, he has done work that has us on the map of doing things that are nationally the best. Now I am challenged by some of his decisions on some cases and he knows and I call him and we need to deal with those issues. But the gentleman from the um, House of Correction is extremely sick. Um, and so I think Earl Buford is gonna be able to talk about that work that's happening at the county uh, House of Correction and um, I was gonna uh, have the county executive come up, but instead county executive, I'm gonna ask DA Chisholm if you would join the panel so that you can talk about the work that is happening and how those pieces uh, are interconnected. Um, so, um, and so, so back to where we are. So this panel, the effort of this panel is to speak about what is happening in reentry, and I think it's important for us to know. So, if I was to um, if I was to tell you that my role now is to be a co-chair of the governor's minority unemployment task force committee, you might say, "Excuse me, you want to sit on the governor's what?" Um, but my agreement was I would sit on the committee if we could create alignment. If we could create alignment with what the state is doing, with what the county is doing, and what the city is doing, because we lead in the nation in incarceration of African American men. And our reentry was one of the things that the Justice Center identified as a problem, our community corrections division. They told us mental health, they told us our community corrections division, they identify some other stuff that I'm not gonna go through now, but today we wanna talk about that re-entry piece. What is happening? The Justice Center, it's another Oprah full circle moment, 
is here doing a technical assistance grant to help us to redesign our reentry division. That leads me to the woman that I'm so glad came to Wisconsin. First of all, let me say, Secretary uh, Wall of the Department of Corrections is few people that I've been able to call when they've been the Secretary of the Department of Corrections and say, you know, you need to think about agriculture and entrepreneurialism because, you know, some of those people who were drug trafficking were entrepreneurs. They were just selling the wrong product. Um, you need to think about doing some, you know, some work like that. And they created a Grow Academy where young people are coming and they're learning about agriculture. Agriculture is a huge mechanism upon which to also deal with behavioral issues, deal with mental health issues. And so it is a place where there is synergy. It also connects to the urban farming and what Will Allen and Walnut Way are doing. So I'm saying to you that this secretary got it, but he also picked a lady. And her name is Dr. Sylvia Jackson. And Dr. Jackson has come and has been one of the reasons that we have the Justice Center here doing the reentry work in the state of Wisconsin to help us redesign our system. I want you to hear her, the work that is being done. She is not going to be able to get to all that she can, but this is just pulling the onion back a little bit so that you can know that we're making progress. Now, let me be clear. Don't think I stood up here and said we have arrived, because we have not. I'm just saying we're making progress. Well, good morning. I want to thank uh, Dr. Pam Malone and my good friend Senator Taylor for inviting me to be here today. I really consider it an honor to speak um, before this large group. In fact, I had no idea the audience would be this huge. Um, you've heard that I'm relatively new to the reentry director position. I've been in this job for 19 months. I did try to hit the ground running. It's an awesome responsibility that I will never actually um, effectively deliver but I'm doing the best job I can. But I'm not brand new to the Department of Corrections. I've come up through the ranks. I spent 20 years administering the juvenile justice system as the administrator and the assistant administrator for the Division of Juvenile Corrections. So my heart is with the kids. And when I hear about the problems in high school, the graduation rate issues, we've really got to tackle that. After juvenile corrections, I spent about two years in the Division of Community Corrections as their policy chief. So I have a sense of where the Division of Community Corrections is with the work that they're doing um, in providing uh, new directions for our agents. So what I want to do this morning is share with you how the Department of Corrections is changing how we do business when it comes to the area of reentry. I want to provide you a picture of what we're doing today. And it looks relatively different than the past. And I'm part of that change process. But we don't have all the answers and we, we've got a long road to go. And I really want to be here today because I want to hear from you, I want to learn from you, and I want your suggestions about how we can improve what we're doing. So what's the scope of the issue? 97% of offenders who are incarcerated in Wisconsin prisons are someday coming home to their community. We all know that. Today we have approximately 22,000 people incarcerated in Wisconsin prisons. Each year we release about 8,000 individuals back to their communities. And here in Milwaukee, we release about 2,400 returning to the Milwaukee community. In DOC, we want those individuals to re-enter the community as changed people with the new skills and more education and training that will help them secure employment and prevent reincarceration. These individuals are coming home to their families. They need to earn a living wage to financially support themselves and their families. So the question is, what is the Department of Corrections in the area of reentry planning doing to address this? Here's our vision. We want reentry to promote offender success from the point of admission all the way through discharge by applying what we call evidence-based practices that are designed to reduce recidivism. So if it isn't evidence-based, we don't want to spend our resources on it. So as reentry director, it's my job to use current scientific evidence to guide the delivery of correctional services. When we talk about reentry in the Department of Corrections, we talk about it beginning at the first contact with our agency. That would be uh, at intake at um, Dodge Correctional for men and at intake at Tachita Correctional for women. At intake, we conduct a comprehensive assessment to determine an offender's risk of reoffending, meaning whether they're high, medium, or low risk of reoffending, and we use a compass tool to do that. Compass also assesses an offender's criminogenic needs. 
identifying the key criminal factors that have treated effectively will enhance the likelihood of success in the community. We're following the National Institute of Corrections principles of effective intervention that have shown to reduce recidivism. So on your tables, a little bit of um, education here, I've uh, handed out laminated cards. And the, the principles of effective intervention that we're all about now in the reentry process are on one side of that laminated card. The other side are the eight criminogenic needs that we're trying to work on. We have more cards up here at the front if you need those. So based upon the assessment at intake, we want to target our resources to individuals that are medium to high risk of reoffending, and provide the interventions that they need to address their criminogenic needs. That's what's going to make a difference. Our social workers in the institution and our agents in the community develop case plans that identify the services. I'm just going to hold this. The services that. Um, <clears throat> that will address those, um, those criminogenic needs. I want to give you an example, because sometimes this sounds pretty academic. What am I talking about? Um, let's talk about the area of antisocial cognition. This means focusing on a person's risky thoughts, their beliefs, and their feelings that got them into trouble in the first place. This need would be added to an offender's case plan, and they'd be assigned a cognitive behavioral intervention to address that criminogenic need. Offenders will be assigned other primary treatment programs at intake based upon their identified needs. Such examples would be substance abuse treatment, anger management, domestic violence, sex offender treatment, and the list goes on. I want to give you a flavor of um, the number of people served in those areas in the last year. DOC provided 887 inmates anger management, 1,469 inmates cognitive programs, 550 domestic violence programming, and over 4,400 substance abuse treatment. But that's not the end of it. We also assess their health needs, their mental health needs, which are critical, and their educational needs. Uh, we recognize the importance of educational programming to an offender's success in returning to the community. And to that end, the Division of Delta Institutions offers a range of educational programs, such as GED, HSED, and career technical education and apprenticeships. We had approximately 3,500 that were engaged in these types of programs in the past year. That's a large percent of the population, but we could reach more. DOC's vocational programs are certified through the Wisconsin Technical College. We had nearly 1,200 inmates involved in technical programs and 696 completed various technical um, education um, certificates. Another way that we're helping people um, prepare for reentry is work. And they, uh, we have actual um, jobs available for them within the institution. Also, when offenders move their way to minimum security or a correctional center, of which we have several here in the Milwaukee area, they may be approved for work release. Last month, we had 192 work release sites around the state in areas like automotive, agriculture, Senator Taylor's favorite area, construction, manufacturing, and other related businesses. So these jobs provide an opportunity to learn a skill and work under a supervisor. But we also have the Bureau of Correctional Enterprises and the Badger State Industries that provide jobs and training for inmates to provide them marketable skills. Last year, we had 435 inmates employed by these two enterprises. And DOC is exploring new training opportunities to prepare uh, offenders releasing uh, to employment in what we call the high demand fields that pay a living wage. DOC is partnering with the Department of Workforce Development and Milwaukee Area Technical College to provide what's called computer numerical control operator training at the MATC downtown campus. MATC is providing an accelerated 14 credit CNC technical education certificate for DOC inmates that are in the work release centers here in Milwaukee as well as individuals on DCC supervision. I spend a great deal of time with Dean Walker. I don't know how many of you know her in the room but she and I have become kindred spirits in this area to make this program a reality. To date, we've had 18 graduates com uh, complete the training uh, at MATC. And I want to just give you a flavor of how hard this is, and it shows the commitment of people returning to the community. The first class that we had go through the MATC campus were offenders from the um, uh, work release centers, uh, Felmers, Cheney, and Marshall Shear. They had to uh, go to their work release jobs during the day, 
return to the center in the evening for um, meals and, uh, and sleep, and then arrive at MATC at 10 p.m. at night and go through eight hours of training on third shift. So they were there in training from 10 p.m. at night till six in the morning, and those people completed the training. We graduated 11 individuals, and they're all working, so I'm very pleased with that. <clears throat> so since this is a pilot, um, the second group we tried were, uh, were men on DCC supervision. They um, were working uh, during the day in the community and then had to arrive at MATC at 4 p.m. in the afternoon, and they were uh, in training from 4 p.m. till midnight, so a second shift training. They, too, um, most of those individuals um, successfully completed the program, although there were greater barriers in that area. But I'm kind of most excited about the group that we have in training now. We have 14 women from the Milwaukee Women's Center that are engaged in the training. And so this is the first time I think we've had a non-traditional uh, vocational training opportunity for women where they will be able to earn a living wage when they complete the training. <laughs> there are a lot of jobs in the Milwaukee and Southeast area of the state in the CNC operation, and the typical job starts at $19 an hour. DOC is also partnering with DWD and Gateway Technical College to provide CNC training inside the prison walls through a mobile lab. So we actually purchased a 44-foot gooseneck trailer and put the CNC mills, the lathes, the computer simulators in there. So we're now running that program at Racine Correctional. And again, it's, some, it's the kind of thing that um, the Department of Correction can't do alone. We didn't have the money for the instructor, so we're able to use the funding from the Becky Young funds that, that Senator Taylor was helpful in getting us, and then um, uh, the Gateway Technical College provides the instruction. We've already graduated one class and the second one is underway. But the bottom line here is providing vocational training opportunities that will match people with available jobs in the community. And we want people to return home uh, with jobs, but that comes down to connecting with employers. All of this is for naught if we aren't able to engage employers in actually giving people a second chance. I want to mention just a couple other initiatives. I know my time is limited. I won't go into the um, Council of State Governments Justice Center pilot uh, to the extent I would want to, but that'll give us the opportunity over a three-year period working with my good friend Earl Buford. We spent a great deal of time together. MAWIB is the centerpiece uh, for this grant here in Milwaukee. We want to give people the opportunity to um, have their risk of reoffending and their job readiness level match the type of services that they're going to get. Can you speak to if you're working with employers? We just had um, about a week and a half ago, we had uh, an employer breakfast down at um, MAWIB, and uh, our goal with Senator Taylor was there, Representative Hutton, um, we had a number of uh, secretaries there. Our goal is to really engage employers. I, we, I was hopeful that we'd have 30 to 40 employers. We had about 20. But 20 is better than none at all. And I think it's everybody's job to help bring them to the table. And I need your ideas about how to do that. So a couple other areas. Um, we have a Windows to Work uh, workforce development program statewide. And then in Milwaukee here, it's run by the Milwaukee Area Workforce Investment Board. Starts in the institution where uh, offenders are enrolled three to nine months prior to release. These job coaches come in. They do cognitive intervention. They do a whole series of job readiness things to get people ready for return to the community. And then they follow people up about 12 months once they're in the community to help with um, job search and job retention. And then uh, just a couple other areas on uh, mental health. I mean, I would be remiss if I didn't mention mental health. It is like one of our major, major issues in this state and, and in Milwaukee. So we have a pilot underway uh, with the Department of Health Services where um, we have um, contracted case managers through the Opening Avenues to Offender Success or our ORS program where eligible people who are severely mentally ill and who are high risk of reoffending, we have to get back to the research again, and who are releasing to 36 of 72 counties in the state. They have the opportunity to have a contracted case pan manager that puts together a wraparound program. So by the time they release, they have housing set up, they have psychiatric services, they have financial management, and they have other supports that they need in the community. And what's interesting about it is we already have data. I'm trying to market our, our data. It's, it's a program that works. We're seeing a dramatic reduction in recidivism for the severely mentally ill that go through this program compared to their counterparts who are being released that don't get the ORS program. So for legislators that want to hear about it, we have the data. 
And then just a couple more things. Um, the disabled and mentally ill inmates um, through the DOES project, uh, Disabled Offenders Economic Security, we contract with Legal Action of Wisconsin to provide um, free attorney services to offenders who are disabled so that they have applications for SSI, SSDI, and health care benefits prior to lease. Legal Action of Wisconsin is doing a fabulous job. They have a 57% success rate in getting these applications approved so that these individuals have economic support in the community. And, they're, and that's compared to a 38% rate um, uh, for the rest of the nation. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the other area of reentry that is absolutely critical for each and every person returning to the community, and that is access to health care. One of the things that we started working on about nine months ago when I took this job is to put a system in place so every individual releasing from prison applies for Medicaid, for Badger Care Plus, prior to relieving, leaving the institution. So we've used the resource that, there, that is there, it's the inmate phone system. We've reprogrammed it to call the 11 work, um, income maintenance consortia agencies and individuals can apply through a phone interview for Badger Care Plus. They get their forward health cards um, within 10 days of the application and they leave the institution with access then to prescription medication, health care, and um, uh, mental health care. So, I, so far, well, this has been in place since the end of January. We've had 1,500 offenders go through that. So my goal, and spread the word, because some, uh, some individuals choose not to apply, and that's a mistake. It's harder to do this once you're in the community. In closing, I just want to say that the Department of Corrections is providing a range of opportunities to help people change their lives. We're doing the best we can. We have limited resources. We don't have all the answers. And I welcome your suggestions today about how we can partner together to make this area a success. Thank you. Thank you, Next, we will have, well, we'd like to wish Brother Jose Hernandez, the Assistant Superintendent at the House of Corrections, a speedy recovery. And to take his place will be our county exec, Chris Abley. He will tell you, because he is in charge of the county, what is going on at the House of Corrections. So give him an applause. Thank you. Actually, I, I was here. Uh, I'm happy to pinch hit for Jose, but I was here because uh, I wanted to be here, and I'm here anytime he can talk about just how much has changed in the House of Corrections in the last two years. Uh, so I'm happy to quickly go through a list. I'm sure I'll miss a few things because uh, Jose knows this uh, better than anybody. Uh, as many of you know, a little over two years ago, we took over the management of the House of Correction. Prior to that, it had been managed by uh, the sheriff. Uh, the, sheriff uh, the sheriff's idea of uh, what should be going on at the House of Correction uh, was zero programming, no work release, nobody out on Huber, people woken up in the morning with bullhorns. Uh, not my idea of how uh, you make a difference or empower. Uh, so a few things have changed. Uh, right now, when people go to the House of Correction, we have over two dozen skill certification programs which are based on the job market here in Milwaukee. We partner uh, with MATC and other partners. Uh, we've also given hundreds and hundreds of GEDs. Uh, we do that also in partnership with uh, MATC. We do job interview training, resume preparation. People are automatically enrolled in the Affordable Care Act when they get out, and that's generally the first insurance they've had. We used to do uh, commissary accounts on paper. We do them on uh, debit cards now. That's often the first bank account somebody's had. We have partnerships with the Hunger Task Force. Uh, we have work crews for parks, work crews for highways. The print shop used to be dormant. It's activated now. And inmates, uh, every day they work is a day off their sentence. Last year, that was over 3,000 days. And here's what's happening during those days. They're getting work experience. Uh, and in the print shop, just as an example, we partner with nonprofits around the county. Uh, and by the way, if anyone's got a nonprofit, you need low cost printing. I guarantee our, uh, our costs are great. And you will be helping us provide work experience. Uh, we do posters, mailings, we do silk screens, t-shirts, embroidery at large scale. At first it was hard to get uh, nonprofits to sign up. Now we have a giant list and we are providing hundreds and hundreds of uh, mailers. We used to have a dormant recycling program. It's not dormant anymore. Uh, we do the recycling not just for the house, not just for other departments of the county, but we've reached 
reached out to the city, to MMSD, uh, it's got to be to nonprofits, but to anybody where we can help save money uh, and give more work experience. Uh, as you know, uh, food at the House of Corrections used to be uh, Nutriloaf. If you haven't had Nutriloaf, that's a good thing. You're not going to like it. Uh, nobody has it at the House anymore. Uh, we've reactivated the cafeteria. We partner. Um, we partner also there with MATC. Uh, people get training in how to be sous chefs and learn, but their food is better. What they serve is better. We learn uh, a lot more. Uh, just about uh, a month ago with uh, Earl here, who is, I think everybody's going to refer to as about the easiest guy to work with, uh, we announced that we are a recipient of one of 10 Department of Labor grants in the United States. Uh, this is huge, uh, to build a job center in the House of Correction. Uh, that's something we should feel good about. And Senator Taylor, uh, uh, this in, in, in what will surprise nobody, we've gotten very involved in vermiculture and wood and forestry. Uh, we've been working on partnering uh, with uh, the city on uh, forestry, uh, thanks to uh, Senator Taylor's persistent uh, suggestions. As some of you may know, Senator Taylor is persistent. This, this just in. Uh, but I guess the way I like to get people to think about this is if you think about the first scenario where old house of corrections, 10,000 people or so come through every year, when they came out, all they had had was bullhorns in the morning, uh, and if anything, frustration, difficulty. I mean, the sheriff had a policy where it was extremely difficult for visit, to do visitation, to connect with people. Uh, we have partnerships with a lot of the faith community where you can do remote visitation now. We make it as easy as possible. But you think about someone coming out of the house then versus somebody coming out of the house with a GED, a resume, interview training, insurance, a debit card, uh, and uh, a lot more job opportunities. Guess who's more likely to get back on their feet? And if that's not what we're supposed to be doing in government, I don't know what is. What's amazing is that all of that has happened in two years, and to say that uh, the sheriff hasn't been the most uh, uh, supportive partner is a little bit of an understatement. I know some of you who've worked with me on this know uh, the sheriff early on threatened to arrest Superintendent Haifman uh, without telling people. He removed uh, medical equipment, uh, he removed uh, ammo, he removed all the canine units, he played with the staff, uh, he stole a van back and forth. We were stealing it back. It was a long... It, nobody would believe this if you actually, it, you actually knew. But here's the thing. What I know is I've been to a graduation ceremony and I've seen inmates holding GEDs and proud of it. Uh, and that is when we're doing the right thing. So everybody up here, uh, I, I mean, I know it goes without saying, we're all in the same wavelength here, but this can make a difference and we can scale it up. Uh, and if this is what we can do in two years with resistance, imagine what we can do uh, with more time and more buy-in. So anyway, thanks for here and thanks for letting me pinch hit. Thank you, Tony. Chris Doing great things over there. Okay, next on our agenda is Mr. Earl Bruf Buford. He will talk to us about workforce. Okay, here you go. Thank you, Ms. Jordan. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let's see if I can get this to stay. Nope, then it can work, so. My name is Earl Buford. I'm the President and CEO of the Milwaukee Air Workforce Investment Board. I'm not running for office. I am not running for office. That's what I said. So I'll make that clear right away, okay? Thank you. So um, first of all, when I start these conversations, I've been in the job 15 months now. I, I've been in this community for a long time, but not in this job. So I always start off by asking, who knows what a Workforce Investment Board is? Not you. <laughs> truly knows what it is. No, no one here, anyone. Can you tell me what, truly what a workforce investment board is? If you don't know the answer, that's okay, I can tell you. I'm going to be a little wonky on you for a second. So, 1998, Congress passed the Workforce Investment Act that created workforce investment boards. Basically, the public workforce system was created. There are about 3,000 workforce boards all around the country. There are 11 in the state of Wisconsin. There are three in the greater, greater Milwaukee or southeast Wisconsin area. So, none of you knew that, correct? So basically, we are not truly a job agency or training agency. We are a planning coordination body that brings in federal dollars and leverages and aligned resources in the community. That's what we're supposed to do. So my job has been to bring it back to the, the basics of what we're supposed to do. Not train people. That's what agencies are for. That's what MATC is for. Our job is to align with them, leverage with them, coordinate with them, and bring dollars to the table. So our annual budget, about 75% of our dollars go out the door. 
So when you hear collaboration, like uh, Connie Zek mentioned and others, our job is to help bring those resources or to coordinate so we go to scale and do what the center's been talking about for a long time now, align workforce development around economic activity. That's what we do, plain and simple. So last summer, Congress actually passed a new act called the Workforce Innovation Opportunities Act. Congress ac actually passed something last year. <laughs> and the president signed it last July. <clears throat> so that created some new systems. What it did is it changed how our funds come in. So the way we're funded, Department of Labor sends money to the state of Wisconsin, Department of Workforce Development. The governor gets 15% off the top to do whatever they do want to do with. I think they create a fast forward with those, with those workforce dollars. The rest comes to the 11 boards through a formula system. We only board that has one county. We're the largest board because of the population that we serve. So we receive more money than the other boards by virtue of our community. Just got to put it plain and simple on the table. So because of that, we have a very strong responsibility to Milwaukee County residents, although we are what's known as a city-led board. So it's, I wouldn't even get into that. It's a different story. So workforce now and how reentry fits into that. So a couple of things we changed a year ago when it came on was we wanted to change this from a supply model where we're just funding strong programs to a supply and demand model. We're working with employers and having them at the planning body, helping us understand where the jobs are at, what kind of resources can we allocate to them so they can start hiring and training. Because one thing, if you know about manufacturing, it, it died, correct? Yeah. Well, one of the reasons it died is, one, offshoring. But second, they stopped training or stopped creating apprenticeships. Plain and simple. I haven't trained apprentices in over 20 years. We helped create a new apprenticeship classification last year called Industrial Ma uh, Manufacturing Technician. First one in the state of Wisconsin in 20 years. Okay? And endorsed by the Department of Labor last year. So the very first apprentice in the, state of, in the, in the United States was a black female, city of Milwaukee. Okay? Brandy Edwards. The very first one in that new classification. That's the job we're supposed to do as a workforce board. So I'll get into some specifics. So over the last couple of years, we've worked very closely with, with a few, very few people. One, Mayor Baird and I created what's called Compete Milwaukee and endorsed by the Common Council. Alderman Stamper here is one of the endorsers of that. Thank you. Welcome. So what that did, it created a couple things. It created this thing called Industry Advisory Boards. It created five boards of employers across five sectors, manufacturing, construction, healthcare, hospitality, and financial services. And really what that is is to get employers at the table as a planning body to explain what their needs are, help us develop training programs that get into their real jobs. And we're not talking about any employers. We're talking about anywhere from the Harley Davidson GEs in manufacturing, Freighter and Aurora in healthcare, the Bucks, Potawatomi, and Northwestern Mutual on the service side, and all the downtown hotels, uh, financial services, BMO, uh, <clears throat> Northwestern Mutual again, Chase. They're all, all the, the big players are involved in this planning, which is, hasn't happened before or at least in a long time. So I'm very excited about them at the table. The flip side of that is really our next phase for us is to get our community-based partners and our social service agencies stronger. We don't want to eliminate them. We don't want to um, be in competition with them. We want to support them and uplift them. So we're doing everything we can to get dollars to our agencies so they can really get people ready. Because it's their job to get people ready for the jobs we're going to identify. So that's another, another strategy we come up with. And Compete Milwaukee also developed transitional jobs programs along the state through the Transfer Milwaukee program. So a lot of programs came together to create this transitional program through Compete Milwaukee. And the city last year opened up 135 city department job slots, DPW, DCD, DNS. So we had transitional job workers, house, um, house authority, port authority. They all took on TJ workers last year. And they were paid 1066 an hour. <clears throat> the nice part about that is we're also, the MPD also stepped up. So the, you may have heard about the police ambassador program. Well, that's, that's been funded through this Compete Milwaukee initiative. I mean, it's going extremely well. I think there's a story yesterday in their food drive. So that's some of the, those are some of the things that happened at the city level. And the county exec was uh, humble, but not mentioning his new, uh, his new strategy, Uplift Milwaukee, which we, we unveiled a few weeks ago. And we're waiting for the uh, county board to move it forward as well. So Uplift uh, will we'll work with, will be a catalyst for uh, around the arena project not just the construction pieces, but the, all the other ancillary economic development uplift that happens, service jobs with pathways, the health care openings. So we want to really get people from very distressed neighborhoods, mostly the, most, the neighborhoods that you all know about, that we talk about on, uh, often, how to get those folks into these jobs that we know are there now. And so every seed or resource that comes in is helpful. So we plan to also leverage some dollars that the county exec and the county board are going to approve. So there's just a lot of things going on right now. But we still have issues. 
So as much stuff is going on, we start to keep doing stuff and make sure it lines and make sure it scales up. And it has to really be connected because we don't always connect in the city. All right, we, but we're here to talk about reentry, right? Okay. So some of the things happened in reentry. My good friend Sylvia Jackson referenced a few of these. So the Milwaukee Reentry Network was created in 2009, and we revived it. I'm now the co-chair with Dr. Jackson. We've got a strong network of reentry partners, community-based reentry partners. Um, the DA's office has been involved, the police department. A lot of key, we have some new members coming on board. I'm talking about you. Yeah. Stand up, Shanhill, please. Be noticed. Please. So we're really trying to build a coalition around this subject. So one, we can't align and scale. Okay? It's not about one or two groups, it's about all of us doing this together. So through the entry network, we've had lots of lively discussion. We hosted the employer summit, which next year we're going to double the number of employers. That's a promise. Um, but what also what really came out of that was we can we try to triple. We're gonna celebrate. We're gonna celebrate the 20 and get to 70. That's the goal. You heard it. It's on print now, right? Okay. So reentry network. All right. A um, couple of good things come out of the reentry network. I was very fortunate about five years ago to be part of a, a group in D.C. Uh, the Department of Justice, Council of State Governments that wrote a white paper on a new strategy called Integrated Reentry Employment Strategy, or IRIS model. And at the same time, I didn't know this, but our Senator Lena Taylor was working in the Department of Justice on some other things. So. So luckily, luckily for both of us, the council state governments decided to do a pilot project in three cities, Palm Beach, Philadelphia, and Milwaukee. So I, I don't think the center I knew that when we started this work on the, on the side five years ago, it would come back to Milwaukee. So I think we're both very pleased that Milwaukee is a major pilot reentry project <clears throat> with some sustainable funding, uh, technical assistance from the Department of Justice, council state government. So that's, that's a big deal. And I don't know if we publicized it enough, so maybe we should start talking about that more and more than just here. It's a really big deal for Milwaukee. Actually, Philadelphia just dropped out. They, they couldn't sustain it. So it's only, it's only us and Palm Beach. So really, the only urban city involved in this pilot is Milwaukee. Right. And give me two more minutes, and I'll finish up. So um, County Exec also referenced the House of Corrections, all the good work went over there. I love working with uh, Assistant Superintendent Jose and the Superintendent Mike and getting a job center. So we were awarded half a million, one of only 10 in the nation to receive that, to put a job center in the House of Corrections. So here's what a job center is. So in our big network under the workforce, where we operate what we call uh, uh, job centers. So right now we have two job centers in the city of Milwaukee. You most on the south side, and for the past few years with YWCA, moving forward, we will be Maximus on the north side. But now we'll have a job center in the House of Corrections. So what that means is we will get a chance, we will get a chance to bring in and leverage employers training before these men are released. So they will have all the certifications or as many as possible to match up with those jobs that the advisory boards are gonna tell us are really out here. Not just the entry level jobs, but the scalable family supporting jobs that these men and women can walk into. So we, it's, again, another big deal. And that's, a lot of that stuff came out of the Milwaukee Reentry Network. So again, that, that leverage uh, partnership is what made a lot of this happen. So I'm really excited about that. I could probably sit here all day and talk about a lot of stuff, but. I just really wanted to mention those two big initiatives and all the work we're doing. I also hear rumor, it's a good rumor, that the Milwaukee Bucks want to really get involved with the reentry game. Yes. Yes, right? Okay. Right? Thank you, Senator Taylor, for that. But I want to make sure that if there's anyone, if there's anyone working with the Bucks or any representatives out, in the, out here today, please tell them don't create anything new. Work with what's already working. Leverage with what's already leveraging. Otherwise, we're going to have another parallel program that's going to help five people instead of 500 people. So that's how I'm going to conclude today. Okay. I just want to make sure that was known. Thank you for your time again. Thank you, Mr. Buford. Next, we'll have Mr. Neil Thorson. He is the chief of this region, of Region 3, Division of Community Corrections. Thank you. There you go. Do what you do. Good morning, everyone. It's, a, it's an honor to speak here this morning, and it's a little bit humbling for me. Um, I've been the chief here in Milwaukee for almost three years now. I started off about 14 years ago as a probation agent on the south side of Milwaukee, and then I was um, promoted to a supervisor. I worked downtown for a couple of years, and then I was promoted again, and I moved up to a sex offender unit on the north side of Milwaukee. I was there for about three years, 
And after that, I took a little bit of a vacation, I like to call it, and I worked out in Waukesha County and Jefferson County for a while. And it was during that time that I think I realized how much I missed working in this community and how much of just a different philosophy it is when you go out west as compared to here as far as all in it together in Milwaukee. Um, there's a lot more people that recognize that not one entity or one agency is going to turn the ship around. So when, when, when I was able to come back to Milwaukee, I jumped at that opportunity. And fortunately, there were some folks in higher power that, that saw, I think, something in me that suggested that I might be able to make some good changes here in Milwaukee. So, so I've been back. Um, I think what I'm going to talk about a little bit with my brief time is, is a little bit more philosophical than what Dr. Jackson spoke to. I wanted to go back a little bit to when I was an agent in training those years ago. What I really learned um, was how to write a revocation summary effectively, how to prepare a violation report, how to testify at a revocation hearing, how to write a quality pre-sentence investigation for a judge. What I didn't learn as an agent back then was how to empathize with people, how to speak to somebody to, to bring out the intrinsic want from that individual to change and to do better, not only for themselves, but for their families. I didn't learn about community. I didn't learn about how to, to really feel when something is going wrong in the community. You know, you don't get that. We didn't get that in training. When I got to the field, I think, picking up on what Senator Taylor talked about, I learned that some of those blondies were the ones that were recognized for doing a good job, but they weren't doing a good job because sending somebody to prison doesn't really, it, it's not what we're about. So intrinsically, I knew that there, something had to change. And as things work out, at the same time, the research and the sociologists were looking into this entire concept about what really makes somebody want to change, to not reoffend, to not go back to prison. Um, I'm going to steal a line here from Warden Mitchell in the back of the room. The concept of no entry, meaning don't go to prison in the first place, those types of issues. So as I was feeling this at the same time, nationwide, there was this change in philosophy and there were researchers looking into how we can actually go about codifying and defining the types of areas that we would want to work on as an agency in order to make people change. And, and that's sort of where we're at today as a department. Now, when agents go to training, when they go for their 12 week days of basic training, they still emphasize some of that information and some of that technical expertise about writing revocation packets and things like that. But they also spend a tremendous amount of time on subject matters such as motivational interviewing, which is an actual discipline and a skill set where individuals then can, can work with someone and build that one-on-one -on -one connection that's so important. They talk a lot about trauma-informed care, knowing that somebody's experiences really speak to how they make decisions as adults. That's, that's very important. They talk a lot about things such as case planning, knowing that it's important to be working with an individual on a limited set of goals, not throwing 20 to 30 sets of standards at somebody and expecting that they're on their own going to be able to figure out all those multiple moving parts. And, and also we talk a lot about now rewards and incentives. When I was an agent, um, there still was that philosophy about trail them, jail them, nail them. That was that terminology that you heard. Now that's gone. What we talk about is when somebody does something good, you recognize that positive change. You provide them with certificate. You attend their graduation ceremonies like um, Dr. Jackson spoke to and, and, and represent it, Executive Chris Abley. Thanks, sorry. I should get that right, I, I suppose. But, <laughs> But again, it, it's, it's those little things. It's, it's myself going to the graduation ceremonies at the Milwaukee Secure Detention Facility and letting those men and women know when they complete an alternative to revocation program that I as the chief care about what they're doing and that my presence there is, is what I expect from my agents. And then last but not least, it's how we talk to people. Um, I think a lot of the men and women that we deal with throughout their entire life were told that they were not doing things right, that they were a problem. And I want and I hope and I expect from my agents a different sort of interaction. Um, and we spend a lot of time, myself and my assistant regional chiefs, making sure that we're giving the tools to our supervisors who can then coach the agents in those types of communications that we know, based on the research that Dr. Jackson spoke to, actually create changes in people. So that's the philosophical piece. 
Now a little bit on the analytical side. As far as some of the continuation of the programs that Dr. Jackson spoke to, we have a budget of about $6.2 million here in Region 3, which is Milwaukee County, that we utilize to work with folks like Earl Buford Shop at MaWeb to provide space for our offenders. We pay for them to go there and get services. Same thing I heard mentioned earlier, ProTrade. We have a contract with ProTrade where our offenders can go and get those types of skill sets. In addition, we, we spend a lot of money on the higher criminogenic need programming. For instance, cognitive behavioral programming is a big one. We have a large contract that helps men and women rethink um, how they are going to respond to the stressors in their life, and that speaks to that antisocial cognition that's extremely important. Um, we also work um, closely with the fam family and marital issues. We have a contract with our batterer intervention programming, so when men and women have issues when we speak to interpersonal communication and interpersonal dynamics, they don't make that poor decision to act out violently, rather they're able to address the issue um, without causing harm to others. Last but not least, I wanted to talk a little bit about where we're going next. I wanted to mention something called the Dosage Probation Project under the philosophy of no entry. It, it's, it's a part um, of the Community Justice Council. And what it is, is rather than somebody getting a defined term of probation, we take a look at what their criminogenic needs are and actually how much dosage they need as far as, as what's gonna make them um, succeed and offenders then are able to engage in programming and earn their way off of supervision early rather than having them be on for a determinate amount of time and when they engage in that dosage programming what they're doing is addressing the top criminogenic needs so then they don't go on and reoffend. also um, as I indicated or as was indicated earlier that iris model that integrated reentry and employment services that's really exciting for us because we, have, as a division, has, have switched how we determine somebody's risk to reoffend. We're using actuarial assessments, kind of stealing models from the insurance agencies and the medical field. And what the Integrated Reentry Employment Services pilot does is it takes those actuarial scores that we know through meta-analysis really suggest someone's risk to reoffend compared to their cohort, and it marries with, with the work that Earl Buford Shop does as far as how ready is somebody to have a job. And what that results in is we don't then put somebody in a position where we set them up to fail. Because the last thing we want to do is get somebody a job, but they have so many things going on in their life that they only are able to keep the job for a couple of weeks. They end up getting terminated, and then it's, again, reinforcing the negative, and it's what they've probably heard for a lot of their life. So that's why that integrated reentry and employment services pilot that we're doing here is so important. And, and really, it just speaks to that general concept that we're not here as an agency to break people down. Rather, we're here to build them up. And, and the last thing I think I wanted to talk about a little bit um, specifically is the Community Partnership Outreach Program. That's another newer ent uh, enterprise that we've undertaken. And it involves a lot of men in, that are at the Milwaukee Secure Detention Facility completing alternative to revocation programs. Um, I might get a little technical here, but the individuals there are probably the most acutely at risk to return to prison. There are men that have committed a violation of their supervision such that we feel that the best way to address their, their issues is to place them in a program that removes them from the community in a prison type setting. So we took a look at that population and we felt that we needed to do more for those men for the simple fact that they are so close to going into the prison system for the first time or returning. So what the Community Partnership Outreach Program does is it sends caseworkers before the individuals even ever start the program to start to work with them, to tool them up, to provide them with something that's called pre-treatment, to open their minds a little bit. So when they hit that program at the Milwaukee Secure Detention Facility, they're ready to gain max benefit from it. Then the social workers and the caseworkers work as a team together to keep that individual engaged throughout the length of that alternative to revocation program. Upon conclusion of the alternative to revocation program, if the individual is successful, then upon release, they go right to that caseworker shop and that caseworker then starts to address some of the lower criminogenic needs. A lot of time that's employment with referral to, to, to MaWeb. Um, that's when we start to address things like school, where Dr. Sylvia Jackson mentioned our work with MATC. Um, we start to look at things again, um, aftercare when it comes to substance abuse, who the individual is hanging out with. So right now we have about 68 men in that community partnership outreach program. We're hoping to expand that to 100 before the end of the calendar year. 
And again, um, it, it really is important to us as, as far as the concept of making sure that my agents don't break people down, rather they build them up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thorson. production.